Now, A&E takes you to the new world where many a man searched for the secret of eternal life. Who was Juan Ponce de Leon? And what did he find on his quest for the fountain of youth? It's one of the stories of the ages, one of the ancient mysteries. Before we unlock the future, we must find the keys to the past. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Join me and open the door to ancient mysteries beginning now. From the beginning of time, man has recognized the unique quality of water. And when it was discovered that life could not exist without it, tales of rejuvenation and the magical powers of water flowed forth. These stories concerning restorative springs and purative fountains can often be found in religious teachings and in the ancient folklore of several diverse cultures. The exploration of the new world revealed an abundant source of new riches, among them the possibility of prolonging life itself. In the late 1400s, when European explorers set out to conquer this unknown territory, there were three world powers, each with its own principal objective. The French sought to expand the fur trade, the English wanted land for new colonies, and the Spanish sought gold and other fabulous treasures. To this day, St. Augustine, Florida is where many people believe the Fountain of Youth exists. They also believe that here is where Juan Ponce de Leon discovered miraculous waters when he first landed on the Florida Peninsula in 1513. The first written account of Ponce de Leon's endeavors that would forever link him to the Fountain of Youth comes from Peter Martyr, a 16th century Italian priest living at the court of King Ferdinand II of Aragon. In chronicling Ponce de Leon's first attempt to conquer Florida in 1513, Martyr wrote, There is an island in which there is a perennial spring of running water of such marvelous virtue that the water thereof being drunk makes all men young again from decades of the new world. 1516. Today, Martyr's account is steeped in controversy. People are skeptical that the Fountain of Youth could be found in the New World, and many are unconvinced that Juan Ponce de Leon was even looking for this ultimate wonder. But why did Peter Martyr write that the Spanish explorer was in search of such mythical waters? And why do some people believe that such rejuvenating waters exist? We'll examine these tantalizing questions as we unravel the ancient mystery behind the search for the Fountain of Youth. If you travel to St. Augustine, Florida, you can visit a place that some claim is the location of the Fountain of Youth. This spring is allegedly not only the waters that Juan Ponce de Leon sought, but actually found. Modern historians, however, were quick to call this claim into question. The great American historian Samuel Eliot Morrison, who studied the route of Juan Ponce one day, said, we'll never really know for sure where he went and where he ended up on the Florida coastline until somebody at the same period of time, the same season of the year, resails his route. So in 1989, Douglas Peck, a historian, sailor, and navigator, did just that. Under similar conditions, he retraced the journey of Juan Ponce de Leon. Peck presented his conclusions to a panel of historians at a news conference in December of 1991. These conflicted with his previously held beliefs. Following the log of Ponce de Leon's journey, Peck pinpointed where the explorer landed, Melbourne Beach, just south of Cape Canaveral. This position is almost 125 miles south of St. Augustine. 
The question arises, why such a discrepancy? Could it be because Ponce de Leon kept a very crude log of his travels? From his charts and, and the recordings that he made, uh, we know that his latitudes were incorrect by at least a degree or more, in some cases maybe as much as three degrees incorrect, which places would place him further south. Most modern historians agree with Peck's findings. St. Augustine was not where Ponce de Leon came ashore. So was the Fountain of Youth in the New World, and was it in Florida? And was Ponce de Leon actually in search of it? The legend of the Fountain of Youth was firmly entrenched in European culture during the 1500s. So the idea that an explorer would go after such a miracle was by no means far-fetched. People were strongly influenced by the poets with their images of exotic, far-off lands. So much so that many adventurers who landed in the New World expected to see strange, rare, and marvelous things. Many other explorers sailed to the New World, but not one of them has been linked to the search for the Fountain of Youth. Who was Ponce de Leon? And why was he forever tied to this extraordinary legend? The early years of Juan Ponce de Leon are shrouded in mystery. Historians have estimated his birth date to be in the year 1474. We don't know exactly when he was born, um, but that he did come from a, a fairly noble family. Um, Ponce de Leon is a noble name. He was probably an illegitimate son, and that's why we don't know ex exactly um, everything about his background. But it's, it's pretty fairly certain that he was um, born in, in Campos in the Kingdom of Leon. As a young man, Ponce de Leon earned a reputation as a fierce warrior. He joined the Spanish forces that eventually defeated the Moors of Granada in 1492. Led by King Ferdinand II, this victory put an end to Muslim influence and power in Spain. That same year, all Jews in Spain were given three months to either convert to Christianity or leave the country. While in Germany, geographer Martin Benheim made the first terrestrial globe that showed that the world was round. But the biggest event in the world at that time was the expedition of Christopher Columbus. The Spanish exploration began with uh, Columbus. In 1492, he wanted to reach the east by sailing west. And it wasn't a, a, a very unheard of idea at the time, but he was um, the first to pull it off. He actually thought he had apparently reached the Indies when he um, hit the small group of islands uh, known as Cuba and Hispaniola. A proven warrior, seasoned in the heat of battle, Juan Ponce de Leon was now older and wiser and searching for a fresh challenge. Juan Ponce de Leon was a typical Spanish nobleman and by all accounts, reasonably well off. But in order to be deemed important in the status conscious society of medieval Spain, he had to achieve great wealth. And the Indies, the New World, might just hold the key to making such riches possible. At 19 years of age, he shipped off to the New World on Christopher Columbus's second voyage of 1493. And in the New World, he soldiered in various campaigns. And then in 1506, he was given the responsibility of conquering Puerto Rico for Spain. In 1507, he succeeded in that conquest. And in 1509, he was named governor of Puerto Rico. He served in this capacity for three years. However, while he was in Puerto Rico, events were taking place that would have a profound effect on his life. Christopher Columbus had died in 1506. After a while, King Ferdinand and the courts decided that Columbus' two sons would have the right to govern lands discovered by their father, including Puerto Rico. Diego Columbus assumed the governorship of the island. 
out of a job, Ponce de Leon decided to go after any lands that Columbus hadn't claimed. The reason uh, Ponce set out on his exploration was to find new lands to settle, to govern. He was hoping to find um, significant mineral wealth, gold, silver, precious stones, pearls. He also was looking for Native American populations that he might use either as laborers or to actually enslave them and take them back to the Caribbean to, to use on his lands and to sell to other uh, Spaniards there. And he came to the conclusion that very probably the best plan before him was to seek for the island of Bimini. Now, that's not the island of Bimini in the Bahama chain that bears the name Bimini today, but another very large island that was projected to exist north of Cuba. The island of Bimini first appeared on a map published in 1511. This chart was produced by Peter Martyr, the same Peter Martyr who played such an important part in linking the Fountain of Youth to Juan Ponce de Leon. He had a habit of interviewing navigators who sailed throughout the Caribbean Sea. And on the basis of what he learned from them, he constructed a map of uh, the New World, at least uh, the Caribbean Basin part of it. And just north of Cuba, he drew a large landmass that he called Island of Bimini. Still in good favor with King Ferdinand, Ponce de Leon requested permission to search for Bimini. His Majesty's answer is contained in this document, known as the first capitulation for discovery of Bimini. To the officials of the island of Española, Juan Ponce de Leon wrote me upon settlement of an island that is called Bimini. I have commanded reply that we have committed this business to him. I, the king, February 23rd, 1512. Juan Ponce de Leon set sail from Anasco Bay in Puerto Rico on March 3rd, 1513. He journeyed northwest along the Lucayan Islands, now known as the Bahamas. After 11 days of traversing the Lucayans, he came to the northernmost charted island, the one known today as San Salvador. Here, on an island that had been discovered by Columbus, Ponce de Leon resupplied his three ships and resumed his own quest. On March 27th, off the island of Eleuthera, Ponce de Leon and his crew turned westward and sailed out of sight of land. They were crossing through what we know today as the Strait of Florida. They had no way of knowing where they were with no land in sight for six straight days. But one of the things that troubled them as they passed through this body of water was the fact that they had trouble keeping a westerly course. They were pushed north, and they were carried farther north than they were able to shoulder their way west. That was, of course, the Gulf Stream, or the Florida current that they had encountered. The current carried them north, pushing the ships toward new territories. The historic discovery took place during Easter week, April 2nd, 1513. This account describes how Ponce de Leon settled on a name for his conquest. It was written by Antonio de Herrera, a renowned Spanish historian, 90 years after the event. And thinking that this land was an island, they called it La Florida, because it was very pretty to behold with many and refreshing trees, and it was flat and even and also because they discovered it in the time of flowery Easter. Historian Antonio de Herrera, 1601. Ponce de Leon was ecstatic at his great discovery. But exactly what motivated the explorer's journey in the first place? The landing in La Florida brought great satisfaction to Juan and his party. But the natives were less thrilled by his arrival, and there are two schools of thought as to why the local populace was so hostile. 
Some historians believe that Juan Ponce de Leon may not have been the first Spaniard to reach the coastline. By the early 1500s, the Spanish settlement of Hispanola, first established by Columbus, was in need of more slaves. Hispanola is the area which today forms the nations of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. The two factors that account for the decrease in the number of available slaves were the harsh labor conditions imposed by the Spanish and the introduction of European diseases, diseases to which the natives had little immunity. They began dying in large numbers. To replace them, certain slaving expeditions were conducted by Spanish navigators throughout the Caribbean Sea, and one or more of those slaving ships may have happened upon the peninsula of Florida. If so, Florida was discovered by Spain uh, before Juan Ponce got there in 1513. And it may account for the fact that when Juan Ponce did come, he was greeted by the native peoples with great hostility. It may also account for the fact that on the Gulf Coast of Florida, Juan Ponce reported that he found a native who, quote, understood the Spanish language, unquote. Other historians believe that the Floridian natives may have been refugees from various Caribbean islands. These people had been under attack by the Spanish from the time Christopher Columbus began settling the area. Refugees from those areas had certainly come to Florida seeking uh, some kind of refuge from their impression into slavery. And so therefore, the Native Americans in Florida knew something about the Spanish, knew about their ways, uh, knew what they were coming here for. They knew they weren't coming here to be friendly. They really, they believed that they were coming here to attack them to, and to impress them into slavery and to carry them away from their family and from their land. Whether refugees or natives of the peninsula, there is no doubt that they didn't welcome the explorers. The Spanish chronicler, Antonio de Herrera, described Ponce de Leon's reception in the New World. Herrera, writing in 1601, tells us that Juan Ponce had no desire to enter into hostile relations with the natives of this island, but he was forced to it because the natives attacked him almost at once with arrows and clubs and attempted to seize his boat, his oars, and his weapons. And so Juan Ponce did fight back. One of his men was knocked unconscious, two others were wounded, and the rest of the party was able to make a safe escape. Following this engagement, the party sailed farther south to Jupiter Inlet, where Ponce de Leon planted the cross to confirm his possession of the land in the name of King Ferdinand II of Aragon. Was it here, despite their hostility, that the local people could have told the explorers about a source of miraculous waters? Virtually every Native American ritual I know of has some use of water. And so I'm sure that if any explorer had asked an Indian uh, about a local well or a spring that might have had some kind of magical properties, certainly the answer would have been yes, because water was seen as very powerful because it springs from Mother Earth. When two people come into contact with each other that don't speak the same language, often it's a little difficult to translate and understand what, what one means to the other. And so if Ponce came here and asked for a fountain of youth, we don't know exactly how those Native Americans might have understood it or even known what his question was or why he was asking that question. And we don't know how they might have directed him. And Juan Ponce de Leon was certainly aware of the fountain of youth. It was a myth that was pervasive in 16th century Spain, where the legend took its roots from ancient folklore. We know that in Europe and in the Middle East, there was a very lively belief in such a fountain. It was a profane, erotic belief that was frequently featured by Renaissance painters. And that Eurasian myth of a fountain of rejuvenating waters may have followed the Spaniards over to the New World, may have become part of the lore of the islands of the Caribbean. The exact source of the myth remains a mystery, but there's an age-old belief that predates Christianity and was popular in the Middle East. Water that springs from the earth is a magical gift of the gods. In the Mesopotamian River Valley, there are basically two seasons, rainy and dry. 
Now, one of the Babylonian gods of water was also called the Great Physician. And in rites to this particular god, uh, patients were washed and sprinkled with water from either the Tigris or the Euphrates or from a spring that bubbled up from the earth. So here we can see an early instance of where not only water, but a water from a particular source is seen as being curative, medicinal, or in some way special. So in these regions where water was scarce, it was seen as not only necessary for survival, but also as something to be revered. Tales began to spread about enchanted water. We don't know much about the origins because they go way back in oral tradition before anyone was recording them, of course, but we know that all over Europe there are really old and very widespread stories about the fountain at the end of the world that has rejuvenating or healthy properties. Uh, it's probably one of the most widespread folk tales all over Europe. One of the earliest accounts of the fountain of rejuvenation is believed to originate from an ancient Indian epic, the Mahabharata. Historians estimate that this was written somewhere between 400 BC and 400 AD. In this tale, priests are looking for a ritual drug called Soma. They acquire the drug by telling a man who has Soma where the river of rejuvenation is to be found. Our hero finds uh, this mythical river, Sarasvati, and bathes in it. And from that point on, uh, he no longer ages. And beyond that, he's also ritually purified, religiously purified. The interesting thing about this is that to this day, uh, Hindus in India celebrate the bathing in the Sarasvati. Every 12 years, there's a very large uh, ritual gathering, a pilgrimage, called the Kumbh Mela. And it meets at the confluence of the Ganges and the Yamuna rivers. And supposedly at this spot, the river Sarasvati, which is a mythical river, which nobody can see, also uh, comes in. And if you bathe at that spot, then you're ritually purified. And also there's uh, this element of rejuvenation. But if this story's origin is in India, how did the idea become so firmly ensconced in European culture? We know that there are cultural interchanges between Europe and India, uh, mainly for trade, but there's always a tendency for cultural products to be exchanged as well along trade routes. So most of the versions of the Fountain of Youth myth, as they're found in Europe after the 11th century, always located the Fountain of Youth in India, in the Far East. And of course, Ponce de Leon thought he was in the West Indies. And so he thought he had a good chance of actually finding the Fountain of Youth. Another famous folk tale widely disseminated during this time of European exploration and discovery is known as the Well at the End of the World. This story is believed to predate the Bible. In this story, as in many stories, there are three brothers, the sons of a king, and this king has fallen ill. The three brothers volunteer to go to search for the water of life that will cure their father. Either to heal the king's blindness or uh, very often to heal some kind of disability, a physical disability, probably most often to uh, stave off the effects of old age uh, and to increase sexual powers. As people got older, one of the things they believed was that if they got the right kind of magical water, they could uh, rejuvenate their sexual potency as well. Of course, as in any fairy tale, two of the brothers are evil and one of the brothers is good. By his virtuous conduct, the youngest son meets a dwarf who tells him the secrets of where to find the water of life and how to get past the many obstacles between him and this fountain. He goes on to find a castle that is protected by a large gate. He gets past this gate and gets past two roaring lions, where a princess who awakens from sleep leads him to a fountain. He takes a cup full of this water and manages to take it back to his father, who drinks of it and then is healed from his ailments. The bad person goes on the same trip trying to get power 
thereby and gets ground up by the poisonous gate or the stampeding horses or the bear that uh, attacked, whatever, whatever problems the first person had to go through. So it's also seen as a story that divides the good people from the bad people. This particular story has become one of the most widespread stories in the Western world, and it's so widespread that people actually apparently believed it, that there was a well somewhere at the end of the world, and if you could only get there and find it, you could get rich, you could cure your illness, you could cure blindness, uh, you could cure your broken leg, whatever it might have been. Especially you could uh, enhance your sexual potency. And so maybe it represents wishful thinking, uh, wishing for a condition that people didn't have, and seeing water as the means by which they could obtain it. The idea of restorative fountains with waters possessing the power to heal still exists today. And of course, the most famous example of that is the spring at Lourdes, which was only found in the 19th century. But already, it is attracting uh, thousands of, of visitors in pilgrimage. In fact, every year, over three million of the faithful flock to Lourdes in France. It was here in 1858 that a 14-year-old girl named Bernadette Subaru claimed that the Virgin Mary appeared to her 18 times in a secluded cave. A spring was discovered at the site of the apparitions, and since then, people have made a pilgrimage to the area to drink the water which they believe has the power to heal. This is one of the many places in Europe that is believed to house healing fountains. During Ponce de Leon's lifetime, rumors of the exact location of the Miracle Springs were rampant. Based on legend, some believed that mythical water was to be found in India. Others held that the wells in Ireland and other Celtic countries had restorative properties, particularly for sexual rejuvenation. But the most commonly held belief was that the fountain of youth could be found in the New World. There is little doubt that when Peter Martyr wrote of Ponce de Leon's exploits in 1516, that the Italian historian was aware of this folklore and that Ponce de Leon, too, had heard these extraordinary tales. I'm sure de Leon and other explorers would have known the story uh, very easily. It would have been one of the most widespread stories in Europe. I'm sure that they couldn't have avoided it. And certainly most of the explorers thought that the New World provided them with all kinds of magical possibilities, as well as treasures and new people. There is little controversy whether Juan Ponce de Leon could have heard of the Fountain of Youth. Juan Ponce de Leon managed to discover a rich and important part of the New World, but he was not the only Spanish explorer in the year 1513. Vasco Nunez de Balboa led an expedition to the west and became the first European to sight the eastern shore of the Pacific Ocean. In England, King Henry VIII personally commanded the army and captured the towns of Trunal and Theroan and thus defeated the French in the famous Battle of the Spurs. Meanwhile, in Italy, Nicholas Machiavelli finished writing what would prove to be one of the most controversial works of the Italian Renaissance, The Prince. In this book, he argued that an effective ruler should be pragmatic rather than virtuous in his power. Most modern historians dismiss the idea that Juan Ponce de Leon came to Florida exclusively to search for the Fountain of Youth. Today, it is widely believed that the explorer had twin motives for his mission, the lust for gold and the glory of conquest. There are two pieces of evidence that go against uh, saying that Juan Ponce sought such a fountain. One, his asiento or charter from King Ferdinand of Aragon, which authorized him to undertake his voyage, contains no mention of such a fountain or of such a search for a fountain. The document is meticulous in its specification of all of the goals and purposes of the voyage that Juan Ponce was to undertake, but nowhere mentions a fountain or rejuvenating waters or restoration of youth or anything of the sort. Another 
point uh, that needs to be raised in this matter is the fact that there is no existing contemporary narrative or report that establishes that Juan Ponce even had a fountain of youth on his mind. But later historians and historians in the 16th century, shortly after Ponce's expedition, begin to discuss the fountain of youth and discuss it as being on the island of Bimini, which is the land that Ponce was trying to discover. And so therefore, through some type of association, Ponce becomes associated with the Fountain of Youth. In 1511, Peter Martyr drew the first map that showed the island of Bimini. In 1516, he wrote the first account of the expedition that Ponce de Leon made to the New World. Martyr clearly states that finding the Fountain of Youth was one of the goals of Ponce de Leon's journey. But why did he make this assumption? Peter Martyr was an Italian with strong political ambitions. He began his career as an aide to the Duke of Milan. While still in his 20s, he parlayed this position into becoming secretary to the governor of Rome. A staunch supporter of the Renaissance movement, Martyr made powerful friends, including a count who was the Spanish ambassador to the papal court. In 1488, when Martyr reached the age of 30, this count persuaded him to move to the Spanish court. Ordained as a priest, Martyr was appointed chaplain and humanist of the royal household. He became a confidant of both Ferdinand and Isabella and was allowed to record firsthand accounts from the explorers of their investigations into the new world. From these stories, Martyr wrote two major works that chronicled the Spanish discoveries over the course of 32 years. Why would Martyr have included the story of the Fountain of Youth in his historical account of Ponce de Leon's explorations if it had no basis in fact? Though he was an Italian, uh, he probably was caught up in the Spanish ethos of the period. It was a prevailing tendency in Spain to take myths very seriously. Myths such as uh, El Dorado, the Gilded City, uh, the myth of King Solomon's Mines, for which even Christopher Columbus went seeking. They were onto a whole new world of discovery. They had far less understanding of what they were likely to find, but their hopes were very high. And in addition to hoping to find gold and silver and jewels, they were also perhaps looking for things that would be healthy for human existence here on Earth. And I suspect that's how they happened to uh, go after the story that there was such a fountain of youth. Myths drove uh, the people of Spain. In this particular period of history, it was common for Spaniards to take such myths very, very seriously, even to uh, build stories around them. And I think that Peter Martyr was caught up in that tendency. Additionally, the Spaniards at that time were driven by Christianity. And as in many world religions, water is considered by Christianity to be sacred. But why did man attribute restorative properties to water? Because water is one of the primary elements uh, in cosmogonic myths, or myths of the creation. And in fact, in a number of myths of creation or cosmogonic myths around the world, uh, water is the primordial element. There is nothing else but water. There are different aspects that are given to water in terms of what it means and what it symbolizes and how it functions. Uh, in the Old Testament, for example, at the very outset in the book of Genesis, when the earth is created, creation comes out of water, a primeval force. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And the dry land was called Earth. Genesis, Book 1, Chapter 9. But water, as the source of creation, is not restricted to Judeo-Christian teachings. In fact, in the Vedas, a group of ancient Hindu hymns uh, water is said, paradoxically, to have existed before existence. So it is the primary substance, um, and it is the building block for creation in a lot of cosmogonic myths. 
Darkness was hidden by darkness in the beginning. With no distinguishing sign, all this was water from the creation hymn of the Rig Veda. How do creation myths explain the rejuvenation power of water? There's an idea that the primordial waters existed before history and before time had a chance to, to wreak its havoc uh, on the world and on human beings. So by having contact with blessed water or holy water, um, you can actually reach beyond history, beyond time, and supersede the, the effects of time and aging. It's also important to keep in mind how valuable a resource water was in early societies, particularly when examining Ponce de Leon's search for the fountain of youth. Water to the people of the Renaissance period, the late 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s, was very much uh, a reminder of life, and they associated it with life. And so to think of the possibility of finding fountains that give life in an abundant fashion would perhaps make them more receptive to stories, to accounts of fountains or springs or even rivers which would give life-giving sustenance. Fountains, sacred pools, sacred springs were a part of both Christian tradition and Greco-Roman tradition. And if you think of Ponce de Leon as a Renaissance man in the truest sense of that word, then he was um, well aware of these various traditions. And it's highly likely, given a very imaginative mind, that he would believe that these sacred fountains to exist and would think that they were a worthwhile project to see. Today, most historians agree that it's unlikely that Ponce de Leon went forth with the object of finding the Fountain of Youth. As in many cultures, the indigenous people of Florida believed in the idea of healing and rejuvenating water. Well, apparently, the legend came from uh, Native Americans in the Caribbean who claimed to travel to the Florida area to rejuvenate themselves at a fountain or a spring. And the Spanish, in their translation of that concept, had translated it to the idea that the fountain not only rejuvenated, but also restored the youth of people. Historians at one time speculated that Floridians may have told Juan Ponce de Leon about the magic water, possibly for the purpose of misinformation. Many native groups would often tell the, the Spaniards, we know of this other place where there's great gold, great kingdoms, and it's not here, it's over there. And so why don't you go and leave us alone? And in, in fact, um, Many of the, the natives of Mexico told uh, Cortes himself that other kingdoms and, had gold and, and other great places far away um, would offer more than they could. And if they could only leave them alone, they should go off and, and find those places. So it was, an old, it was an old trick. But there is no evidence that during his travels through the New World, Ponce de Leon was ever able to have a peaceful exchange with the natives. Shortly after raising a cross and declaring Florida a Spanish territory, the ships sailed further south and around the Keys to the Gulf Coast. The group dropped anchor off the southeastern tip of Santa Bell Island, home of the Calusa Indians. The natives attacked. One person in the Spanish party was killed and three were injured. The remainder withdrew. In mid-October, they arrived back in Puerto Rico. That's mid-October of 1513, and in the following year, Juan Ponce went to Spain to ask for a new asiento or charter, one that would make him governor of Florida and Bimini. And he was given such a charter, and he returned to Puerto Rico and planned, it appears, to undertake another voyage at an early time. 
But the death of his wife forced Ponce de Leon to assume another duty. For the next seven years, he devoted himself to the raising of his two children. At the same time, he must have envied his fellow explorer, Hernan Cortez, who by 1519 was making astounding discoveries of gold in Mexico. Quickened by the finds of Cortez, Ponce de Leon decided to act on his own asiento, and in 1521, the second voyage was underway. This time, he sailed in two ships, on board which were 200 men and women settlers, uh, parish priests, uh, missionary priests. Uh, there were domestic animals. There were seeds and cuttings and agricultural implements. And it was Juan Ponce's desire and intention to establish a settlement in Florida, to build a fort, and then conduct missions to the surrounding native peoples in order to spread the teachings of the Roman Catholic faith. Juan Ponce made a landing all right, and we believe that it was at the same San Carlos Bay that he had visited before. And the reaction of the Calusa natives who inhabited that site similarly was the same as eight years before. The party was immediately attacked as they tried to disembark from their vessels. The colonists vainly tried to establish a settlement, but the Calusa were relentless in their efforts to drive off the would-be settlers. Suddenly, Juan Ponce de Leon was felled by an Indian arrow. Shot in the thigh, the wound became infected, and he was forced to withdraw from Florida for a second time. The party retreated to Cuba, where Juan Ponce de Leon died of his injuries in 1521. In Havana, his dream of great wealth and the colonization of Florida for the glory of Spain, and perhaps for his own glory, died with him. But the link between Juan Ponce de Leon and the Fountain of Youth soon took on a life of its own. Peter Martyr linked Ponce de Leon with the legend. Spanish chroniclers kept the story going. Instead of historical fiction, it became historical fact. And in 1535, Oviedo y Valdez perpetuated the tale by including it in his account of the discovery of Florida. And in 1601, Antonio de Herrera, who leaves us the fullest account we have of Juan Ponce's voyage, states toward the end of his narrative that Juan Ponce did send a ship off to hunt for this fountain, but it's almost like a throwaway line in his narrative, as though to cover all the bases in the event that this myth really was true and that Juan Ponce actually did seek the uh, fountain. We know of no such attempt to prove the existence of the fountain, and nobody found one. From a 20th century perspective, the idea of a single-minded search for the fountain of youth seems pure folly. Yet contemporary school texts, especially those in the English-speaking world, are fixed on the idea that he most certainly was. One reason the myth continues is due to the black legend. This part of the story was perpetrated by the Protestants beginning in the late 1700s. The black legend was an attempt in English and later American historiography to um, cast aspersions on the motives for Spanish colonization of the New World. Now, undoubtedly, the Spanish were after wealth, were after resources and were, in that sense, um, fairly greedy. But of course, they were also very typical for their time. Uh, so were the English in search of wealth in the New World. So were the English in search of resources and land. But by associating Ponce de Leon with the Fountain of Youth, this laughable chimera that he was chasing after is an attempt to make the Spanish look foolish, make their motives seem completely implausible and to basically undermine their project in the new world. Had Diego Columbus declined the governorship of Puerto Rico, Juan Ponce de Leon might have been simply an historical footnote. It was his serendipitous discovery of Florida that made him historically significant. But it is the legend of the Fountain of Youth that made him famous.
While his true claim is the discovery of Florida and the discovery of Florida's Gulf Stream, the legend of the Fountain of Youth has given Juan Ponce de Leon his own special immortality. With the exception of Christopher Columbus, most Spanish conquistadors of the day are forgotten. Almost 500 years have passed, but by a strange trick of fate, the name of Juan Ponce de Leon lives on.